namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Good evening, everyone. Okay. okay, today we'll be studying the Nanda, Nandaka Ovada Sutta. This is called Advice from Nandaka or the Instructions from Nandaka. And this is a sutta which is delivered by a monk named the Venerable Nandaka. And it, <laughs> it is a, a sutta or discourse which is given to bhikkhunis, to Buddhist nuns, for a change. <laughs> and this monk, Venerable Nandaka, was named by the Buddha amongst the monks who are distinguished in particular categories. He was singled out as the monk who was outstanding in instructing bhikkhunis. (laughs) And maybe this discourse is probably the reason why he was given that title. Though I would guess that he must have instructed bhikkhunis on many occasions in order to earn such an honor. But probably this sutta is taken as one example of his teaching. (laughs) Okay, and so this... Sutta begins at a time when the Buddha was living in Savati, Jeta's grove. And at that time, Mahapajapati Gotami, together with 500 bhikkhunis or Buddhist nuns, go to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to the Buddha, she says, Let the Blessed One advise or instruct the bhikkhunis. Let the Blessed One give the bhikkhunis a talk on the Dhamma. Okay, now this needs a little background explanation. First, who is Mahapajapati Gotami? First, She was the foster mother of the Buddha. Because the Buddha's biological mother had passed away seven days after his birth. And the Buddha's father, King Suddhodana, had married two sisters. I think that they were sisters. One was named Mahadevi, the Mahamai Devi. She was the biological mother of the Buddha. And the other was Mahapajapati Gotami. That was her own sister and also the other wife of the Buddha's father. Because in those days, kings were not monogamous, but they would have several wives as well as many concubines or a number of concubines. 
And so when the Buddha's biological mother passed away, then Mahapajapati Gotami brought him up and nursed him and raised him just as if he were her own son. In fact, she had a son of her own named Nanda, not to be confused with this Nandika. But she brought up the Buddha, Prince Siddhartha, just as if he were her own son, with just as much love, just as much care, giving him her own mother's milk, breast milk, Okay, then, after the Buddha achieved enlightenment and came back to the royal capital of the Sakyan Republic, Kapilavastu, and taught the Dhamma within the capital city, she became a devoted lay disciple of the Buddha, along with many of the other members of the leading families of this state. Okay, then the Buddha's own father also became a lay follower of the Buddha. Both of them, at an early point in the Buddha's ministry, achieved sotapati, the stage of stream entry. Then on a later occasion when the Buddha visited Kapilavastu, the Buddha guided his father on, when the father was on his deathbed, he guided his father to the attainment of arahantship so that his father passed away as an arahant, a liberated being. Then, since Mahapajapati Gotami was no longer bound by marital ties. The idea came to her that she wanted to go forth and become a nun, a bhikkhuni. At that time, there was no bhikkhuni order in existence. There were just male renunciants, bhikkhus. But the Buddha had led into the homeless life many of the young Sakyan men from the Sakyan families. And so so their wives had been left as widows. And so traditionally they speak about 500 young men, Sakyan men, princes who had been led into the homeless life to become monks. And eventually they were been led to achieve arhatship. And so there were 500 aristocratic Sakyan women who were closely associated with Mahapajapati Gotami. They were also women of the good families, the royal families. And so altogether they decided that they wanted to become bhikkhunis, to leave the the home life and enter upon the homeless life. And so one day, Mahapajapati Gotami came to the Buddha while the Buddha was staying in Kapilavastu and said, Please, Venerable Sir, allow myself and the Sakyan women to go forth into the homeless life as nuns, as bhikkhunis. (laughs) Please don't get upset. (laughs) But the Buddha said, Please do not ask, go to me, (laughs) for women to go forth into the homeless life. (laughs) A second time, go to me, asked, Please, Venerable Sir, 
let myself and the second women go forth into the homeless life as nuns. A second time the Buddha said, do not be eager go to me <laughs> to go forth into the homeless life. A third time Mahapajapati go to me pleaded with the Buddha and said, Please, Venerable Sir, give permission for women to go forth into the homeless life as nuns. The third time the Buddha said, Please go to me. Do not be eager to have women go forth into the homeless life as nuns. And so the Buddha refused three times. It seems very hard-hearted. This is the way the text has come down, the tradition has come down, whether this is historical fact or something composed by the compilers of the canon. This I cannot say for sure. This I cannot say at all. <laughs> okay, at a certain point after this incident occurred, the Buddha, together with the monks, left Kapalavatu and they traveled southwards to the city of Vesali and they dwelt in a place called the Great Woods. Um, there was a monastic residence in the Great Wood. It's called the House with the Gabled Roof in the Great Wood. And so the Buddha was living there. And when the Buddha traveled southward together with the Sangha, Mahapajapati Gotami together with the 500 Sakyan women shaved off their hair. They put on saffron colored or ochre colored robes and barefoot just like the monks, they followed behind the Buddha and the Sangha. They traveled down to Vesali. And there too, Mahapajapati Gotami came to the Buddha and made the same request three times and again three times the Buddha refused this request. Okay, when the Buddha refused three times, then the women left very sorrowful, sad, disappointed, and they stood outside the residence where the Buddha was dwelling, and then Venerable Ananda saw them. And Venerable Ananda asked them why they were standing there so sorrowful, even their bodies still covered with the dirt and dust of their journey southwards along this dusty Indian roads. And they explained to him that they were trying to appeal to the Buddha to gain permission to go forth into the homeless life. So then, Venerable Ananda came to the Buddha and made the request for the women to go forth into the homeless life. And the Venerable Ananda used a kind of indirect means. First, he told the Buddha, or reminded the Buddha how Mahapajapati Gotami had been so kind and considerate towards him when he was just a little 
infant, after his mother died, how she had brought him up with such love and such affection, nursing him, nurturing him till he reached manhood. And then he asked the Buddha whether if women were to go forth into the homeless life, they would be able to achieve the fruits of realization, the stages of enlightenment, stream entry, once return, non-return, and arhanship. And to this, the Buddha said yes. And when the Buddha said this, then Ananda appealed to the Buddha, please then let the women go forth into the homeless life. Then the Buddha laid down eight conditions or eight what are called Garu Dhammas, which means weighty or heavy rules that nuns would have to follow. And he said, if Mahapajapati Gotami is willing to accept these heavy rules, then this will count as her going forth and full ordination. And so Venerable Ananda then passed this information on to to Mahapajapati Gotami and then she said that she gladly accepts these eight rules and then that marked her going forth as a bhikkhuni and then that was the beginning of the bhikkhuni sangha. And then the other 500 women who came with her, they became the first 500 bhikkhunis. And they received ordination from the bhikkhus. And those were the 500, those are the 500 bhikkhunis who are accompanying Mahapajapati Gotami at the beginning of the sutta. And I should also state that this number 500 that we come across very often in the Buddhist texts is used somewhat symbolically just to signify a large number. And I don't think it should be taken literally in every case. Because often we read that Venerable Sariputta came along with 500 monks and then Moggallana came along with 500 monks and Mahakasapa appeared with 500 monks and Anuruddha came with 500 monks. So <laughs> if each one came with 500 monks, the numbers would be staggering. Okay, as to why the Buddha was so hesitant to establish the order of bhikkhunis, that's a question for a separate discussion. It's not connected with the explanation of the sutta, so I won't go into that now. (laughs) I want to come to the sutta itself. Okay, now, according to the Paragraph 3 in the Sutta. At this time, the Buddha had laid down a principle that the bhikkhus were to take turns in it's what is called here advising the bhikkhunis, but it really means not so much giving personal advice, but it means giving instructions on the Dhamma to the bhikkhunis. And this would take place generally every fortnight or every two weeks on the occasion of the full moon and the occasion of the new moon. These are the Uposita days or we call them in Sri Lanka the Poya days. when 
the monastics recite the precepts. On those days, one monk is assigned to give instructions to the bhikkhunis. And so one monk would go accompanied by another monk so that one monk is not going alone. And at the beginning of this sutta, the turn had come for this venerable Nandaka, Nandaka to go to give instructions to the bhikkhunis. But he didn't want to go to instruct them. And so the Buddha turned to Venerable Ananda and asked Ananda, whose turn is it today to advise the bhikkhunis? And Ananda explained that it's this Venerable Nandaka's turn, but he doesn't want to go to advise them. And then the commentary raises the question, why doesn't (laughs) Venerable Nandaka want to go to advise the bhikkhunis? And sometimes I have to say the explanations given in the commentaries don't seem to be completely credible, or at least I have difficulty believing them. I think that these are tales that Preachers must have contrived in order to entertain their audiences. (laughs) And so I will mention the explanation. And if you're skeptical about it, then please know that I also am skeptical of the explanation. The commentary says that in some previous existence long ago, the venerable Nandaka had been a king exercising kingship and these 500 bhikkhunis had been his concubines, members of his harem. And now they had come together in this life with him as the monk and them as bhikkhunis. And he was somewhat apprehensive that if he were to be seen teaching the bhikkhunis, and another monk who has a divine eye or the ability to see their past lives or to look at them on that occasion, that monk would see, ah, this venerable Nanda used to be the king, these bhikkhunis used to be the women of his harem, In the past, they were inseparable and now they've come together again and they're inseparable. And so this Nandaka has so much attachment to his former concubines that (laughs) even though he's become a monk, he still can't separate himself from them. (laughs) And so because Nandaka didn't want such ideas to arise about himself, he was hesitant to go and instruct the bhikkhunis. Okay, so that is the explanation given by the commentary. Okay, but there must be some reason why he was reluctant to go to teach the bhikkhunis. But now the Buddha gives him some very, perhaps even stern instructions or definitive instructions telling him, go and instruct the bhikkhunis. And probably because the Buddha knows that there is some special karmic connection between Nandaka and the bhikkhunis such that When Nandaka goes to instruct these bhikkhunis, the nuns will spontaneously place faith and trust in his teaching. And by doing so, they will be able to gain realization through his teaching. 
So it's probably not only the case that it's his turn to instruct these nuns, but this is a coming together of a number of conditions. First, it's his personal turn to instruct them, so he should go for that reason. And also, he has such a connection with these bhikkhunis that when he teaches them, they will gain realization of different stages of liberation. Okay, so now since the Buddha has given the orders, Venerable Nandika cannot refuse. Okay, and so that day after he's gone on his alms round, the Venerable Nandika Uh, Nandika goes to the place where the bhikkhunis are living. This place is called the Rajaka Park, Rajaka Rama. And so after the Venerable Nandika takes his seat, the Venerable Nandika then tells the bhikkhunis that (laughs) even then it seems he is not going to give them instructions in the form of a formal lecture or discourse, but he's going to instruct them by way of a catechism that is in the form of questions and answers. And so he says that I'm going to give you this series of questions and when you understand, you should say, we understand. And if you don't understand, then you say that we don't understand. And then if you're doubtful or perplexed, then you ask me to elaborate. And so then the nuns say that even by this much that they're satisfied and pleased with the Venerable Nandaka. Okay, now we come to the actual discourse itself. And the discourse will turn out to be quite a profound discourse. Okay, the discourse takes us into the basic, I call this the basic catechism on the three characteristics impermanence, suffering or dukkha, and non-self, but it's going to be applied to, as we'll see, the six sense, internal sense bases, the six external sense bases, and the six types of consciousness. Okay, and since we've gone through the Chachaka Sutta, the discourse on the six groups of six, we should already know what these are. Okay, what are the six internal sense bases? What are they? Okay, so the six internal bases are the eye base, ear base, nose base, tongue base, body base, and mind base. So these are the six sense faculties, six sense organs considered in their function as an inner basis for the arising of consciousness. So the sutta starts off by taking the I base as the example. Okay, the I base is this permanent or impermanent. Does the I something that lasts forever or is it something that comes to an end? How is this? It's impermanent. 
And we can understand this impermanence of the I at different levels. At the coarsest level, maybe we could understand that the I is impermanent in the sense that, okay, when the body dies, then the I ceases to function. So the I comes to an end. That is, I call this the relatively coarse level of understanding impermanence. But at the subtle level, this is the level that's realized through insight knowledge or insight wisdom. The I is impermanent in the sense that it is undergoing constant arising and passing away. And so from moment to moment, the mind is coming into being and then even while the I persists, even momentarily, it's undergoing change. And then after this moment of undergoing change, it comes to an end, followed by another moment, another occasion of the arising of an event of the I. Then the I persists just for a moment of existence, undergoing change, comes to an end. And then followed by another occasion or moment of the arising of the I, undergoing change, comes to an end. And we can take this process by which the I is arising and passing away, arising, changing and passing away at finer and finer increments of existence. We can cut it down at finer and finer moments. We might say, I already took a rather subtle level of the I's existence. Let us just go, let me just backtrack and say the I lasting a whole lifetime comes to an end at the end of a lifetime. But let us say the I that exists in the course of one year comes to an end at the end of that year. And then we have the I of, say, 2005 is not the same as the I of 2006. The I of 2006 is not the same as the I of 2007. But the I is always undergoing change. In biological terms, we would say the molecules of that I, the cells of the I are always changing. Then, the cells, the molecules of the eye on any particular, in any particular month are always different, always changing. The molecules and cells of the eye on any particular day are always changing. The molecules, the cells of, cells and molecules of the eye on any particular hour, any particular minute are always changing. The molecules, the cell, the cells, the molecules of the eye on any particular second are quite different from the molecules and cells of the eye on some other second. And then when we tune our awareness right to the very microsecond of what we call the let me call this the immediate call it the immediate now, the truly existent now, what is occurring in the truly existent present, that I is something that exists for the finest, most 
micro millisecond, the, the finest micro milli fraction of a second. And the eye during that very micro milli fraction of a second is just arising, existing only for that micro milli fraction of a second and then breaking up and passing away, followed by a new moment of the existence of a new moment of I, which again exists for a tiny micro milli fraction of a second, breaking up and followed by a new I existing for a micro milli fraction of a second, followed by a, which again exists for a micro milli fraction of a second. Okay, and so that is impermanence at the f- very subtlest level. Okay, and now when one sees this very subtle aspect of impermanence, well, let us take impermanence at any level, even the coarse level. Can one say that Anything that's impermanent is able to give true happiness in the sense of lasting, stable happiness? Or is it really, here the word suffering is not so adequate as a translation of dukkha. Dukkha here has the sense of what is unsatisfactory, what is I think a better translation would be flawed. Not in the sense of floored, not like somebody knocked out in a boxing match, (laughs) but flawed, F-L-A-W-E-D, or maybe defective, is what is impermanent, a source of true stable happiness, or is it defective, inadequate, flawed? That is the meaning of dukkha that's intended here. Not suffering in the sense of what's painful or causing misery and unhappiness. And so the answer that comes is what is impermanent. (laughs) I almost said through force of habit, I almost said the monk's reply, (laughs) but now it's the nun's reply. It's dukkha. It's suffering. That's flawed. It's inadequate. It's defective, Venerable Sir. And so if one has something which is impermanent, impermanent in any degree, okay, okay, we take something which is impermanent in the sense of what eventually comes to an end, we could say that that is defective. True? True? But now, when one brings the attention down to what is arising and passing away with this incredible rapidity just constantly arising and passing away from moment to moment many many times every second and then one asks whether this is really able to give lasting happiness whether this is a source of true peace happiness security 
then what is the answer? What is it? Sukha or Dukkha? <laughs> okay. Okay, now this is important point. Now when something is impermanent, dukkha, and subject to change, and here again this translation subject to change is not completely satisfactory because the word viparinama which is translated change, actually has the sense of more subject to deterioration, subject to decay, maybe, or subject to dissolution. Okay, so if something is impermanent, flawed or defective and subject to decay, is it fit to regard this thus? This is mine. This is what I am. This is myself. And remember what I said earlier in an earlier class. Generally, this is my interpretation. One isn't inclined to regard the I as to single out the I and say, it's too bad the words, I meaning the organ of vision and I meaning oneself have the same sound in English. It makes it difficult to explain this point. One is unlikely to think of the I, that is the organ of vision, is I in the sense of oneself. But generally, one is likely to think of this whole psychophysical organism as being I or myself, And so the eye that is the organ of vision, because it's part of this psychophysical organism, also gets included along with everything else as being part of the eye that is what is taken to be the ego or myself. And so we think of this eye that is the organ of vision, as being part of what is mine, part of what I am, part of myself. And so we identify with it, we cling to it, we have the sense of possession towards it, possession and identification. But now, if we understand that this is impermanent, not truly satisfactory, and subject to change, will we regard this as being mine, I am, myself? How is it? Do we? Okay, so, then we apply the same thing, the same way of reasoning is then extended to the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. That is, all the other internal sense bases. And so, Coming down, the nuns themselves say, here, 
just exactly the middle of the page, they say, they sort of sum up the conclusion. They say, no, Venerable Sir. And why is that? <laughs> ah, they indicate that they've already gained insight wisdom. They say, because, Venerable Sir, we have already seen this well as it actually is with samapanyaya, with correct wisdom, with proper wisdom. We have already seen that these six internal sense bases are impermanent. And then Venerable Nandika says, good, good, sisters, so it is with the noble disciple who sees this as it actually is with proper wisdom. Okay, then Venerable Nandika develops the same questionnaire regarding forms, sounds, odors, flavors, or tastes, tangibles, touch sensations, and mental objects. And then the nuns say, again, the sentence beginning with no, Venerable Sir. Why is that? Because we have already seen this well as it actually is with proper wisdom, with correct wisdom. These six external bases are impermanent. Okay, then paragraph 8, Venerable Nandika applies the same questionnaire to the six types of consciousness. That is, going from eye consciousness to mind consciousness. They're all impermanent. They're all dukkha, that is, unsatisfactory or defective and they're all non-self, not fit to be taken as mine, I am, myself. And then the nuns say that they don't take them to be mine, I am, myself. And why is that? Now I'm on page 1122. Why is that? because we have already seen this well as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, these six classes of consciousness are impermanent. Okay, so now we have three groups of six, which we've already met in the last sutta, that is, the six internal sense bases, the six sense faculties, the six sense objects, the six types of consciousness. Each type of consciousness arises based on a sense faculty and a sense object. Okay, and so they're all impermanent. They're all dukkha in the sense of being unsatisfactory, defective. They're all not to be taken as mine, I am, myself. And this is the way they, not just theory, but this is the way they're to be seen correctly with proper wisdom. Okay, and now we come to the similes. There's actually two similes. 
will actually th will eventually be s three similes, but there are two to illustrate the points that have just developed. Okay, paragraph nine. Suppose an oil lamp is burning. Okay, it's oil is impermanent and subject to change. It's wick is impermanent and subject to change. It's flame is impermanent and subject to change. It's I've lost my track. It's oil is impermanent, subject to change. It's wick is impermanent and subject to change. It's flame is impermanent and subject to change. And it's radiance is impermanent and subject to change. Okay. Now, would anyone be speaking rightly who, were to, who would say, While this oil lamp is burning, its oil, wick, and flame are impermanent and subject to change, but its radiance is permanent, everlasting, eternal, and not subject to change. And then the nuns say, No, this cannot be said. And why is that? Because when the oil lamp is burning, its oil is impermanent, constantly being used up, right? The wick is constantly being devoured by the flame, getting lower and lower. In this country, do you ever see an oil, oil lamp? We do sometimes. Of course... In Sri Lanka, we used to use them all the time, so I'm very familiar with them. Before we got spoiled by having electricity put in. But in the 1970s, it was oil, oil, always oil lamps. Even in the 19... When was this? 1984, when they started putting in the solar panels in the place where I was saying, staying... I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> I thought it was corrupting the monastery to put in solar electricity. I thought the oil lamps were much nicer. Maybe we should get rid of these electricity and go back to oil lamps. Okay, and then the flame is constantly burning and using up the oil, the wick. And so eventually, when the flame uses up, if it's left to constantly burn, it will use up all of the oil. When it uses up all of the oil, the flame will go out. And can we expect the radiance or the light of the lamp to continue when it uses up all of the oil? Well, sometimes the oil will remain, but the wick keeps on getting shorter and shorter and shorter. You turn up, there's a kind of screw. You keep on turning that screw to turn up the wick till it reaches a point when there's no more wick even though there might be a lot of kerosene in the lamp. But when there's no more wick and the flame starts sputtering, sputtering, sputtering and goes out. And even while it burns, still the flame is constantly changing. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's bright, sometimes it's dim. So can the radiance or the light be the same? Can it last forever? No. And so now we have these six internal bases. For some reason they're selected here as being impermanent and subject to change. But the three types of feeling I hear mentioned, pleasant, painful, and the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, 
that one experiences and depending on the six internal sense bases, can these feelings be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change? It seems if we're to actually that the simile isn't developed completely because we have in the simile oil, wick, flame. So one thing should correspond to internal sense bases. One thing should correspond to external sense bases. Like oil, wick, flame, maybe to consciousness. Maybe the oil to internal sense bases, the wick to the external sense bases, the flame to consciousness, the light or radiance to feeling. But for some reason, the simile it's used to illustrate the six internal sense bases. And now we have the mention of three types of feelings here. Pleasant, painful, and neither. These three types of feeling can arise based on any of these sense bases. These feelings are always arising and changing depending on the different types of contact occurring through these sense bases. Okay, so we, can we expect these feelings to be eternal or everlasting? Yes or no? Okay, and so now the question is asked, because each feeling, the, the reason is given, why is that? Because each feeling arises in dependence upon its own particular condition and with the seizing of its corresponding condition, that feeling ceases. That is, each feeling comes into being through a particular contact occurring through that sense base with its own object its own consciousness, its own moment of consciousness. And that consciousness arises and ceases. And so the feeling that occurs in connection with that moment of consciousness, that feeling also has to cease. Okay, and so at this point, Venerable Nandika says, when the nuns give this explanation, Venerable Nandika approves and says, good, good, sisters, that is the way it is with a noble disciple who sees this as it actually is with proper wisdom. Okay, maybe... (laughs) I'll stop here and then leave the rest for next week. And then if I finish the rest next week, I'll also try to do No, I don't. I can't do the number 149. There's quite a lot in there. Okay, I'll try to do to finish the sutta next week. I thought I would do this all tonight, but I see it took longer than I thought. Okay, if there's any um, questions, then please um Please feel welcome to ask. Yes, Janet. 
I don't think I would say that the sutta is not. Did I say that the sutta is not ideal? Yeah, I understood the simile, not the sutta. I think what struck me is that the simile mentions one, two, three things, oil, wick, flame, and then through those three things arises radiance. But then in the application of the simile, in the paragraph that goes, so too, sisters, only the six internal sense bases are mentioned as being impermanent and subject to change. And then from those internal sense bases, one goes directly to the three types of feeling. Whereas it seems that if one takes the simile since one has these three things, oil, wick, and flame, it seems that these should represent, one thing should represent the internal sense base. I would let that be oil, since in the oil lamp, <laughs> now my fond memories about, we used to get them in Sri Lanka, made in China. <laughs> The good ones were made in China when we send the boy to the shop to buy the oil lamp. Don't get one that's made in India. Get one made in China. <laughs> um, okay, the oil goes, gets poured into the glass bottle of the lamp so it's inside that cotton wick, the base of it is then dipped into the oil, of course, but then it protrudes outwards, and so it could represent the external sense base. And then consciousness is something which illuminates objects, so it could be like the flame. And then what comes out of consciousness but what comes out from the flame is the radiance or the light. So that is like feeling coming out from consciousness. No. Yeah, normally one would have contact mentioned as the condition for feeling. But maybe it's take, maybe Contact is simply taken to be implied because one has the three things coming together, that is contact, or maybe that is implied by this because each feeling arises in dependence upon its own condition. Then I see I have a note here I think this is my own note because I don't see MA, which signifies the commentary, that the coming together of the eye forms and eye consciousness is eye contact. And this is the primary condition for the arising of feeling born of eye contact. Okay, then with the cessation of the eye, one of the factors responsible for eye contact is removed. And so when eye, when eye contact ceases, and then with its cessation, the feeling born of eye contact also ceases. Yes, please. To get radiance, wouldn't you, you have to have contact to get implied to... To get what? To, with radiance, to, to understand radiance, to, to see it. Wouldn't contact be implied to some extent? So would that suffice for part of the terms that we might be missing here? Well, radiance belongs to the simile and the contact 
belongs to what is being illustrated by the simile, which is to call it the process of perception. Yeah, but one needs contact for feeling to arise. This is part of the standard formula of you know the process of perception, the normal or the process of feeling. Normally, it's said that independence upon the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact, with contact as condition feeling arises. But here, the mention, there's no mention of contact. But contact is definitely implied, or it's definitely necessary. And maybe it's just that indicative that this is not the Buddha teaching, but another monk who has his, his own distinctive style of teaching. So he doesn't always have to be <laughs> explaining the matter exactly the way the Buddha explains it. Okay, any further questions? Okay, if there's no questions, then we'll stop for the evening and we'll continue next week. Um, If I finish early next week, then I'll try to do number 149 as well. So you can read Sutta number 149. It's only, wow, it's it's very dense. (laughs) I thought that I could do 149 quickly, but I see that one could actually give a whole course on 149. (laughs) built up around Sutta number 149, if one wanted to. Yeah, 149 has very, very rich contents. Okay, so we will end by sharing the merits. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva Chirang rakan tu de sanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva. Chirang rakan tu mang parang. Etavata cha amehi sampadang punya sampadang. Da be deva anumodantu saba sampati sedia e tavata cha amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe buta anumodantu saba sampati sedia E tavata cha amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe sata anumodantu saba sampati sedia bhavagupadaya 
Aviti hate the Eight on the rays of the Gayupapanna. Rupiya rupicha asanya sannina.